the February Blue Trails Guide webinar. My name is Faye Augustin, and I'm the Associate Director of Conservation for American Rivers. I'm really excited to have Kara Shiltnick, the Waccamaw River Keeper, join us today for our webinar. And before she uh, presents her presentation, I wanted to run through a couple of quick things. So as always, um, there is a couple of technical support pieces to run through quickly. Um, first, if your connection is lost, please feel free to log back in using your unique GoToWebinar link that was shared with you via email. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on Monday, March 5th for viewing at wechillguide.org backslash blog. We'll also send around a, um, I'll send around an email with the link as well. One other thing to note, um, as I think all of you know, there is a brief delay between um, when the slides are moved forward and when they appear on your screen. So please be a little patient with us and with the technology as we move forward throughout the presentation. Questions and answers are always encouraged during our Blue Trails Guide webinar, and we leave um, about five minutes at the end of the webinar to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so please feel free to utilize your question box in the GoToWebinar side panel of um, your screen. You can ask questions throughout the webinar, or you're welcome to save them until the end of the webinar and ask them um, at that point as well. And without further ado, we will get into the um, actual presentation, the reason why you're all here, Volunteer Water Quality Monitoring on the Waccamaw River, again, featuring Kara Sheltnick, Waccamaw River Keeper. And Kara grew up on the Potomac River and is a lifelong river rat. She now focuses her career on the beautiful black water of the Waccamaw River. She joined, joined Winya Rivers as the Riverkeeper in May 2017. As a part of her work, she leads the efforts organization's education and advocacy efforts in the Waccamaw watershed in both North and South Carolina. Kara is a graduate of Coastal Carolina's University Master's of Science in Coastal Marine and Wetland Studies program, where she studied microbial water quality in the Grand Strand of Coastal South Carolina and served as the coordinator for Coastal Carolina's Water Quality Monitoring Program. She continues her work with the Water Quality, Quality Monitoring Program as field leader for the Waccamaw River Program. So, Kara, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Faye. Um, really excited to talk to everybody about the Volunteer Water Quality Monitoring Program on the Waccamaw. It is my favorite part of my job. Uh, I love working with the volunteers, and any chance to get out and see the river is worth it, in my opinion. But I wanted to give a little bit of background on the Waccamaw Riverkeeper Program and Winyaw Rivers Foundation. So, Winyaw Rivers Foundation focuses on the entire lower PD basin, which covers this huge area in South Carolina and North Carolina and has all these rivers that come into Winya Bay. So we often have people say, where's, where's the Winya River? And I have to tell them, well, there is no Winya River, but there are a number of rivers that come into Winya Bay, which is why we call ourselves Winya Rivers. Um, Winya Bay is the third largest estuary on the eastern seaboard, so it's a huge area to look at. And our mission is to protect, preserve, monitor, and revitalize the lands and rivers of the greater Winya Bay watershed. Um, we like to reinforce with people that what happens on land eventually can impact our rivers and then our bay and then eventually the oceans. So drawing that connection between lands and rivers is really important for our foundation. And so as the Waccamaw Riverkeeper, I get to narrow down my focus to the Waccamaw River subbasin. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So my job is to basically protect fishable, swimmable, drinkable waters in our watershed. Um, 
everybody in our area relies on the Waccamaw one way or another, whether it's for recreation or whether it's for their drinking water or just for being this beautiful natural resource that we all get to enjoy. And so I focus on the river that starts at Lake Waccamaw in North Carolina and that travels all the way down again to Winya Bay. And my job is to focus on our mission through education, community engagement, land conservation, advocacy, and of course the water quality monitoring program. So river keepers often wear a bunch of different hats. We do a million different things, but it's all worth it and it's all, it's not all fun, but it's all really awesome. But like I said, the water quality monitoring program is probably my favorite part. Um, so I'm excited to get to talk more about that today. So the water quality monitoring program on the Waccamaw was initiated in 2006. So we've been going strong for 11 years now, going on 12, and we have really incredible data to back it up. And it was started as a citizen science program, hence the volunteers. And it was a response to requirements by the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System Phase II stormwater permitting. So basically, they were looking at um, non-point sources and how those impact our waters. So municipalities had to focus more on stormwater rather than industrial inputs. And part of that is public education and public involvement. So our program helps those municipalities meet those needs. So we really partner with um, the counties and the cities in our area that are subject to that permitting system. And in 2011, we expanded into North Carolina. So you can kind of see, I'll point with my mouth, mouse. From here down was all 2006, and then from here up, we added these in 2018, or I'm sorry, 2011. And now we have 18 sites in four counties in two states. So this, this program has expanded and it, it just continues to blow me away how awesome it is. So the objectives of our program are again to help those local municipalities sat satisfy those stormwater program requirements. Um, getting the public involved and also educating them. We do a data conference once a year where we get all of our volunteers together and also um, uh, people from the municipalities, stormwater managers, people from DHEC, um, the Department of Health and Environmental Control, and just kind of bring them together and give them a chance to talk about what we're seeing on the river. And these are really cool interactions where you get to put your volunteers right with those people who can actually make a difference. And my job as the field leader is to be the liaison between our volunteers and the people who can take our information and our data and make an impact with it. So being able to cut me out as the middleman at those events and put everybody together is just really cool. Another objective is to assist those local municipalities with illicit discharge detection. In the past, we have been able to identify um, uh, inputs that have been an issue into our river and then kind of retrace our steps and go back and do some source tracking type things and identify where that pollution is coming from. And then, of course, we work with municipalities to do that. Um, our program has allowed us to increase coverage, both temporal and spatial, of the water quality monitoring and develop specific water quality standards for those sites. So each of our sites has this history of data, and from that, we can identify um, percentiles so that when our volunteers go out, they can look at this and say, oh, well, this is above the 90th percentile, so this is really out of range for the site. And then they know that something is going on there and they can report that back to us and then we can report it to whoever needs to know. And the same thing goes for below standards and above standards. But luckily, now that we have that data set, we can establish those standards for each site. 
and those are evaluated um, quarterly. So whenever we do, we do kit maintenance for our volunteers and we reevaluate the percentiles and send them out with new ones so that when they go out, they can identify what's within range. And then because we are lucky enough to work with a state certified lab, we have a little bit of background with QA, QC. So um, quality control efforts for our data. Our data specifically is not state certified because of the methods that we use, but we do work with a state certified lab. So that adds a little bit of credibility to our data, which just makes it even that much more important to us and to our volunteers. They have a lot of pride that they're creating this data set that is actually usable. So I need to give credit to um, our partners. And as you can see, this, this is a huge effort with a lot of different moving parts. Um, the Waccamaw Riverkeeper, me, our program is the field leader for this program, obviously. And then we work directly with the Waccamaw Watershed Academy, which manages the volunteer monitoring program in our area throughout the Grand Strand. They have several different um, water quality monitoring programs in the area, and we all kind of work together. And then both the Waccamaw Water Watershed Academy and the Waccamaw Riverkeeper are both housed at Coastal Carolina University. So they give us office space, they let us use their lab, they they support us in a bunch of different ways that without them we'd struggle to do this program so we're really grateful to coastal carolina university they also allow us to monitor on campus um, typically a graduate student and undergrads on campus will go out and monitor um, every week uh, different sites on campus to see the how the water quality on campus is and then they report back to me if they find any issues so it's really cool that we have this working relationship with Coastal Carolina University. Um, the Coastal Waccamaw Stormwater Education Consortium helps us a lot with interfacing with those municipalities that we report to for their National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permits. Um, they help us kind of quantify what we've done each year so that we can then report that back to the municipalities and then they can satisfy the requirements for their permits. Um, each of the counties we work in supports us uh, both through um, helping us get volunteers but also funding our projects. Because this is all volunteer based, we rely on grants and we rely on their funding to really help us out. So Horry County and Georgetown County in South Carolina, as well as the city of Conway, and then Brunswick County and Columbus County in North Carolina have really helped us out. Um, we also get support from North Carolina Department of Environmental and Natural Resources. And they're really great because when we find issues, we can go to them and they can help us figure out what's going on. And they've always been really responsive and really helpful. We get some of our volunteers through Southeastern Community College in North Carolina, and they have a retiree and senior volunteer program. And they help us get volunteers, which helps us staff our teams. And a lot of their volunteers focus on North Carolina and Lake Waccamaw. Um, Friends of the State Parks of North Carolina, specifically Friends of Lake Waccamaw State Park, have been a major funder for us and have really supported our volunteer monitoring um, program in North Carolina. So we're super grateful to them, as well as International Paper and Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation, who have been funders for us as well. So without all these groups working together, this program would not exist. So it's, it's interesting to see how many different types of group and how many different people have to come together to really make this successful. And that's without even mentioning all of our volunteers. And they're really incredible. We have 50 volunteers, I believe, roughly 50 volunteers that go out and sample. Um, they make up nine teams and sample at 18 different sampling sites. Um, this is one of my, I, I love all my teams, I have to be honest, but these guys keep me in stitches every time I go out to see them. 
and they're sampling at Peachtree Landing on the Waccamaw River earlier this year. And they go out 23 dates a year. It doesn't matter if it's raining or snowing or cold or miserably hot. And in South Carolina and North Carolina, it gets miserably hot, but they're still out there doing their thing. And we could not be more grateful for them. They sample twice a month. We have 23 sampling dates. Um, we only sample once in December because of the holidays. Everybody kind of goes home. A lot of our volunteers are retired um, and they've moved to South Carolina. So they like to, you know, go home for the holidays and enjoy their families. But we keep them here as much as we can. But they're really awesome. And each year they collect over 400 water samples and probably volunteer among all of them over 2,500 hours a year. That's a lot of time. And that's a lot of time that we as the staff and me aren't out there doing all of this work. So without our volunteers, this program would be dead in the water. So we cannot thank them enough. I mean, our funders, we love them and we love all of our other support, but volunteers really make it happen. So these volunteers, like I said, they go out um, twice a month. They go on the second and fourth Wednesday of the month and they sample water quality parameters, including temperature, conductivity, um, dissolved oxygen, pH, turbidity, nutrients, and bacteria. And you can see the meter that they're using. They just use an Orion multi-probe meter or multi-parameter meter that does temperature, conductivity, DO, dissolved oxygen, and pH. And they are all read from that. And then they take water samples, and from their water samples, they run turbidity using a Hawk handheld meter. Nutrients, they use the little nutrient dip strips. And then bacteria, we use micro, Micrology Easy Gel Plus. And that is, that estimates, um, total coliform, and E. coli. So they are doing a lot of work. A lot of volunteer teams don't do this much. They typically have simpler kits that just look at a few parameters. I mean, they, they're still evaluating water quality and that's important, but these guys are going above and beyond. And this is one of our teams in North Carolina. And if you're familiar with river keepers at all, you'll maybe recognize Christine Ellis there in the middle. She is our previous river keeper and now our executive director of Winyaw Rivers Foundation. And both of the gentlemen in this picture are board members for Winyaw Rivers, and they also volunteer their time to do water quality monitoring. So I think that's really cool that they put in all the time and effort to help out. So I always like to show a graph of our data from way back when we started to today. And what I think is so amazing is that you can see these trends in our data. Now this is looking at dissolved oxygen, which is responsive to temperature. So it's going to have a seasonal trend, but I still think it's interesting that we have this amount of data and that data is publicly available and that's the link below but I'll make sure that it gets sent out to everybody um, if they're interested in it. But so this is our full data set right now for dissolved oxygen for three of our sites. And I think it's cool just to see those fluctuations and to be able to understand what's going on in the river. Um, another cool thing about this dissolved oxygen is that um, we were able to identify what happened after the major flooding the past couple years. So in 2015 and 2016, our area saw massive flooding with Hurricanes Joaquin and Hurricane Matthew. And then we saw it again this year because waters were already high and then Irma um, hit Florida and we got a ton of rain. So you can see that the dissolved oxygen kind of fluctuates with the month, as I mentioned in the last thing. But then in 2015, you have these significantly lower and scattered numbers. And this is after Joaquin. So we can see how dissolved oxygen took a dive after Joaquin. And 
it's below the water quality standard, obviously, but um, in black water, that kind of happens a lot. But this is interesting because you're you're getting that influx from runoff, from stormwater runoff that brings in all these nutrients and also organic material. So your dissolved oxygen drops. And then we saw it again with Matthew in 2016. And then we saw it again this year with Irma in, um, oh no. <laughs> Um, we saw it again with Irma this year. So seeing that um, input from runoff is just really interesting. And it's something that our volunteers like to see because we can also see how long it takes the river to kind of rebound back to normal um, values. So, And then another instance that I kind of wanted to talk about that our data shows. Is at Sterrett Swamp, which is a site that we monitor on the river that gets inputs from a pretty broad area. And it's, it's called Sterrett Swamp, but it is on the river and it feeds into our river. And we had some issues there with elevated turbidity and conductivity. So in 2015, our, our turbidity just went crazy. It started getting elevated. You can see that it remained pretty stable up to that time, and then it just skyrocketed up. So we ended up sending out volunteers on a nearly daily basis. We had a volunteer who lived nearby, and they graciously went out and sampled for us. And we sent him out with a psyche disc and got him to take readings, specifically, and especially after rainfall, that's when we really wanted them out there, but they were out there all the time taking these psyche disc readings. And then if they got an elevated turbidity reading, they would take a sample and bring it back to us. What we ended up doing was going to the Horry County Solid Waste Authority because they had a burrow pit nearby in that water, in that sub basin there. And we were concerned that during high flow, they were getting some uh, illicit discharge coming out of that. Now, we didn't really identify them as the non-point source or even point source because Solid Waste Authority in Horry County goes above and beyond. They do so much to reduce their environmental footprint and they're an incredible partner for the Waccamaw Riverkeeper. And um, they just do so much. But we didn't really find out where the pollution was coming from, but luckily, in 2017, it dropped off anyways. So this is just one of those instances where something was going on. We didn't really know what it was, but we investigated it and got the municipalities involved. But in the end, it was kind of not really sure what was going on. But it's still one of those interesting pieces of data that we have. So the whole point of why our volunteers do this is for their love of the river. And the reason we get them involved is hopefully that they will start to care more about the river because they feel invested and they wanna do something for the river. Um, a lot of our volunteers didn't grow up here. A lot of them came here and kind of needed something to do, but now they are passionately involved and it is incredible. So we hope that by getting people involved, getting volunteers out there, that it will just inspire their love for the river and they will also help us protect those fishable, swimmable, drinkable waters um, to provide for their families and their futures. So that's why we do what we do. And that's why I love this program so much and why I've been so excited talking about it. And I really wanna thank you guys for having me today. And I will be glad to take any questions that people might have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kara, for that really great webinar uh, on the water quality monitoring program on the Waccamaw River. So at this point, like I mentioned, we've got about five minutes for questions and answers. So if you haven't already and you have a burning question, please feel free to go ahead and type it in uh, in the question box on your GoToWebinar side panel. So Kara, the first question that we've got for you is, um, what's a a way that a community or a, um, a nonprofit can go about starting a water quality monitoring program um, on their own? 
That's a really great question. And I think it really comes down to those partnerships. I think it's hard to get the funding to do it on your own. Um, South Carolina has just started up with their own Adopt a Stream program. So people, individuals can get involved and become water quality monitors at, you know, wherever they're interested in. But I think our program is kind of cool because it brings everybody together. Um, and I think that's really important. I think it's really hard to do on your own. So I think developing those relationships. And if you live in an area that requires the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System stormwater <laughs> phase two permitting, which I apologize for saying that six million times, um, but if they require that, it's gonna be a lot easier to get something like this going too. Awesome, thanks, Kara. Um, a second question for you is, um, what's the best way to engage volunteers? Um, and are there any ways that you would recommend or that you guys sort of recognize some of the top-notch volunteers um, that you have? Sure. Um, we reach out to uh, community centers, and like I said, that Southeastern Community College, um, they're their retiree and senior volunteer program and any volunteer program like that who has people who are interested in volunteering, that's the way to get people. And just getting the word out there and letting people know that volunteers are needed. We did a conference the other weekend and the amount of people I got to volunteer to help out at this conference was overwhelming. And it was just community members who were interested in what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, and for, we try and recognize our volunteers. We do a volunteer of the year um, recognition, recognition every year. And we're currently thinking up who we're going to recognize for 2017. But our problem is we have so many amazing volunteers that we don't know who to recognize. Like everybody's so amazing. So it's, it's pretty difficult. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks so much, Kara. Um, another question that we've got for you, uh, Kind of goes along the lines of your um, the first question that you answered. Um, what are some of the ways you know? Are, are there specific kind of talking points that you would recommend um, when reaching out to potential partners um, who might be interested in kind of uh, working on a water quality monitoring program with you? Yep, I think identifying their needs, uh, why they're interested in doing a water quality monitoring program. If it's illicit discharge related to stormwater, then you're gonna wanna look at certain things that are affected by stormwater, um, which is basically everything, but um, understanding what their needs are and what they're really interested in addressing and then targeting that with your approach, I think is probably the best way to go. I think, did that answer the question? Yeah, and that was great. Um, awesome. And then I think uh, just looking at time, the last question um, that we have today, and, and you mentioned this a little bit uh, about your volunteers, but have you identified a kind of specific um, or have you kind of looked at what the demographics of your volunteers are? If they tend to be, like you mentioned, sort of more of the retired population or is it pretty diverse also in terms of some of the um, uh, students within coastal Carolina and some of the other uh, community colleges and universities that you work with? Sure, yeah, our Waccamaw River program is predominantly retirees or seniors, um, people who have a little bit more time, and that's just based on who we have available to us here in coastal South Carolina near, you know, Myrtle Beach and Georgetown area. That's our demographic. That's who lives here other than uh, students at Coastal Carolina who are a little more transient, you know, investing time and in training people, you want to make sure that they're people who are going to stick around. Um, our volunteers on campus are undergraduate students, typically in the marine science program, and it's, it's done it for credit. Um, and I actually was the coordinator for it as a graduate assistant. Um, and that's how I kind of got into all of this and really fell in love with it. But yeah, I mean, in this area, the people who live here are older retirees. So that's who we have volunteering for us for the most part. Great. 
Um, well, thank you so, so much, Kara, for the excellent webinar that you gave kind of describing the volunteer monitoring program and what you've done, um, not only to make the program a success, but how it's kind of furthered your work and mission um, as the Waccamaw River Keeper. And I want to thank all of our uh, participants in the webinar today as well for taking the time out of their afternoon or morning to listen in to our Blue Trail Guide webinar series. Um, I'd encourage you to join us next month uh, in March for our March Blue Trails Guide webinar. Uh, stay tuned for a little bit more information on that uh, in the coming weeks. But without um, anything else, I will say thank you again, and we look forward to having you all join us next month. Have a great rest of your day.